Hi, welcome to my math video channel and in this video I will be looking at accumulation rates of change in definite integrals. Uh, that is, we're going to be looking at definite integrals and trying to think about them in terms of rates of change, uh, how much of a quantity is accumulating, as well as the connection of that to uh, definite integrals as measuring area. So we're going to have two ways of thinking about our definite integral. Uh, one is that we think of it as the sum of signed areas that comes from a graph, and the other approach is to think of a definite integral as a net increment of change of some quantity that's accumulated. Let's start with an example that doesn't require any calculus at all. You've probably heard an equation something like distance equals rate times time. Here we're going to generalize that and think about a rate times a time as giving an amount of change. So suppose a tank is being filled at a constant rate of 4 liters per minute, and that happens for 5 minutes. Then we drain the tank at a, at a constant rate of 3 liters per minute, and I do that for 2 minutes. If the tank starts with 30 liters, what does it have at the end? I bet you know how to solve this already. Go ahead and pause the video and try to solve it. Well, what did you do? My guess is you probably multiplied 4 liters per minute times 5 minutes, and that gave you an increase of 20 liters. Then you probably took 3 liters per minute and multiplied it by 2 minutes, and that gave you a decrease of 6 liters. With those two calculations, you can take your starting volume of 30 liters, add the 20 liters that were poured in, subtract the 6 liters that are lost, and we discover that we have a total of 44 liters. That is, we started with our initial value, 30 liters, we added how much it changed during the first 5 minutes, and then we subtracted the amount it changed in the, second, in the last 2 minutes and that gave us our total. And so we have uh, this idea that we take our starting value, we add our increments of change, and that gives us our ending value. And So that gives us our general idea. We have our starting value, we add our increments of change, and that gives us our ending value. There's another way to look at it. What we'll do is we'll take our ending value, and we'll subtract our starting value, and that will always equal our increments of change. Our ending value minus our starting value, this is talking about how much water is in the tank, will always be equal to the summation of our increments, where those increments were found by multiplying our rate times our time. Now we're going to connect that idea to the idea of geometric area. So here I've drawn a graph. I've got the rate as my y-axis and my time as my x-axis, and you'll notice that I've marked my rate is a constant rate of 4 for times 0 through 5, and then in negative 3, that's when it's draining, from times 5 to 7. So that gives me 5 minutes of increase and 2 minutes of decrease. Um, and so what I wanted to point out is when I multiply the rate times the duration or the time, I'm multiplying a y-axis, my rate, times a width on the x-axis, my time, and that physically represents an area. Similarly, while it's draining, I've got a rate this time that's negative, so I'm at a negative 3. My duration is 2 minutes, or 2, and so again I've got an area, except this time when I do the calculation, I think of it as a negative value because I'm draining. It's below the axis. So on the top, I have an area that we're going to think of as a signed area of plus 20. And in the bottom, we have a negative signed area, which is negative 3 times 2, negative 6. Okay. Now we're going to call that the definite integral. So the sum of the increments we'll call 
the definite integral. In this example, our definite integral, this integral symbol means the sum of increments. As my time goes from 0 to 7, my rate, f of x, that's my y-axis, times increments of x, so dx, the change in my time, how long I spend at each rate. And so what we see is the change in the value of my tank, my ending value, and minus my starting value, is the integral of my rate dx, going from 0 to 7. All right, so when we talk about definite integrals, we want to think of it as generalizing the summation of increments of rate times the time. I've got a rate, I've got some function, times an increment of time, that's like a little width of dx, a change in x, and I've got an integral, the summation of increments, as x goes from a to b. So on my graph, a and b would represent some sort of start value and end value of my time. And so I would think about my graph as going from a to b. And the definite integral is the sum of increments. And so that's the y value times a little width. And so I'm going to start thinking of that as shading my um, area between the y-axis, so let me think of that here, my y-axis going from A to B, and my curve. And my curve, notice, crosses the axis. So whenever the graph is above, we're thinking about positive increments. So I get positive increments every time I have it above the axis. And when it goes below the axis, I'm going to think of that as losing a quantity, so it's a negative area. Remember, it's not actual area. A definite integral will be measuring signed area. Okay, and so in this piece, my definite integral would have three contributions. I've got a positive signed area. That would be pouring water into my container. I've got a negative signed area. That's a draining time. And then I add some more in here at the end. And the definite integral is the sum of those three signed areas. Okay, so I want to highlight a few points. First, we're calculating signed area. When my rate function, f of x, also called the integrand, is positive, I have a positive rate. When I have my f of x below the axis, my f of x, my rate of change is negative, I'm going to have negative signed area. All right, the second main point is that when I shade the area, it's between the y-axis and the graph. I meant the x-axis. All right, so what we're doing is I'm taking the x-axis and the curve, and I'm shading the regions between them. And notice that I drew vertical lines at the starting and ending values. Those are found as the limits of integration. And I go from left to right or right to left, always starting at the bottom number, ending at the top number. So when A is on the left and B is on the right, I go left to right. But my signed area starts at the axis and goes to the graph. Always think of that as sort of this vertical increment that we're adding. And our third point we want to remember that because I'm adding increments of change, rate times time, the total definite integral measures a change in a quantity. So when I calculate this number that represents this, the sum of all those increments of change, I get a change in a quantity, and this graph that we're looking at is not the quantity that's changing this f of x, this is the rate of change. And so there's a second quantity, and that's where we'll talk about next. So when I have a definite integral, and I identify what function's inside, and here I'm going to be calling it f of x, but it could have a different name. Maybe it doesn't even have a name. 
This function, f of x, this is called the integrand, we need to think of that as the rate of change of some other function. That function in my picture is called a of x. Doesn't have to be called a of x, but that's what I'm calling mine. And that function is called the accumulation function for the rate of change f. And so the definite integral, that sum of signed areas, is always equal to how much my accumulation function changes. It's my ending value. Notice I'm using the end point at the top minus my starting value, which uses the end point at the bottom. And so this allows me to have an equation that relates three different quantities. First, I have the definite integral of my rate. So the rate is the function. The dx is the increment of time. And so I've got summation of my rate times time. That's the definite integral. Okay. And then there are two other quantities. I've got my accumulation function. I've got its change. So there are two numbers here. I've got the amount at the end, and I've got the amount at the beginning, where I start my journey. And so there's power in this particular equation. I've got three numbers, and so if I know the definite integral, and I know one of the values of my accumulation, either at the start or the end, I can find the value at the other end. Similarly, if I know a formula for a of x, I, I can calculate both a of b and a of a, and I can use that to calculate the definite integral. So this is the idea of calculus. Um, we are going to use definite integrals to know how much things change, but we're also going to find formulas for these accumulation functions. They'll turn out to be something called antiderivatives, and by knowing the formula for antiderivatives, we'll be able to calculate the value of definite integrals. To illustrate this concept, I'm going to use this example. I have a graph of a function. So this is my rate function, f of x. Okay. And I'm going to use the integral of the definite area to measure how much its accumulation changes. So let's read the instructions. Suppose f of x is the rate of change. So this is what's telling me that f of x will be inside the integral. And it's the rate of change for a quantity a of x. So that tells me a of x is the accumulation function. Then it says, if a of negative 4 equals 2, find a of 5. And so I have two values of a that we want to relate. I have a of 5 and a of negative 4. I'll think of negative 4 as my starting point and 5 as my ending point. And so the principle of definite integrals as the change in accumulation, that gives us an equation that we could write down. The definite integral, starting at negative 4, ending at 5, of the rate f of x shown in the graph, dx, so that's my height times my width, will be equal to the change in my accumulation, where I take the ending value minus the starting value. And so we're given the starting value, so we know that a of negative 4 equals 2. We don't know a of 5, and we're going to look at the picture to find the definite integral. Remember, the definite integral is the sum of signed areas. Our signed area starts at negative 4 and ends at 5. So we draw a vertical line to the graph at both endpoints. And then we're going to think about shading the region between the graph and the x-axis. So that was a positive increment we just shaded. Then we're going to have a negative increment down below. And then we have another positive increment because we go back above the axis. And I need to calculate those, cal those physical areas. Think of them as signed areas. So some are positive and some are negative. And we're going to do a summation of signed area. Now in this example we have basic geometric shapes. So as I start at negative 4 and I work my way across, the first thing I notice is I could think of there being a rectangle. So I'm just going to remind myself I'm using a rectangle. 
followed by a triangle. Those are positive. And then I've got a negative triangle followed by a rectangle followed by a triangle. So I've got a negative triangle, I've got a rectangle, and another negative triangle. And then the last little chunk, I've got a positive triangle. And so I'm going to use the geometric formula for area so that I can calculate how big each contribution is. This first rectangle has a height of 4 and a width of 1. And so that rectangle has an area of 4. The triangle has a height of 4, a base of 2, so that would be a rectangle of 4 times 2 is 8, but a triangle is half of that, so we have another 4 units. So we have a total of 8 positive units there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then I have another triangle. Notice I have a width of 2, that's my base. My height is 4, so that is a, an area of 1 half base times height is 4. We're going to count that as a negative 4, because it's below the axis. Then we have a rectangle width 1, height 4. So again, that will be a negative area. And another triangle, base is 2, height is 4, 1 half base times height gives me another negative 4 units. And the last triangle, what do we have? We have a width of 1, that's my base, a height of 2, so 1 half of 1 times 2, that gives me 1 unit, and that's a positive signed area doesn't show up. There we go, plus 1. And so my integral is equal to the sum of those areas. And when I add these numbers up, we have several of the 4's that just cancel each other out. And so I have a grand total of negative 3. Now what that means is my accumulation function has gone down by 3 units. And so I now know that this integral equals negative 3 and so I can calculate how much my accumulation changed. So I'll set up my equation and I'll solve for my new accumulation. My ending value for my accumulation minus my starting value, which was 2, equals the sum of all the changes, which gives me a net change of negative 3. So when I add 2 to both sides, I'm able to solve and I find that my accumulation function at the end of this change has gone to a value of negative 1. So I started at 2, I decreased by 3, I end at negative 1. So that's how I can use definite integrals to think about how much accumulation functions change. There's a relationship that the definite integral of the rate is equal to the change in accumulation.